All right, so um, what I'm uh, presenting today is a BitTorrent client I wrote for uh, 68K Amiga. So I'll just go over the equipment uh, first, or yeah, I'll just do that. Just so you can see what's happening here, because I'm not going to refer to the machine very much during, like, while I'm talking and stuff, because it just kind of sits there, it's running. But what's happening right now, this is an Amiga 1000, and it has a individual computing AC500 Plus uh, expansion card on the side. And plugged into that is a uh, Blizzard Mark IV, uh, I think it's called 1230 or something like that. So 50, it's a 50 megahertz 68030 um, plugged into this. So th this is running kind of like Amiga 4000 power. But this is like an Amiga 1000 right now. Um, what we have running here are two torrents downloading simultaneously. So this, this, this one's showing the peers it's connected to. So, so the, the bandwidth you're seeing, you actually add them together because it's, it's running two torrents at the same time. This is just showing a uh, Ubuntu 17 distribution downloading. And this is a collection of, I'm not really sure what it is. It's a bunch of videos or something of some public domain thing that I just downloaded to, to test. So, so they're, they're, they're just both running at the same time. Um, so, that, so that's just going to sit there and run, and, and I won't say much about it. If it gurus or whatever, you can, you can mention it. But it, but it, it hasn't actually ever gurued uh, recently. Um, anyway, so let me start talking about uh, the actual uh, software and not so much about pointing out the equipment. Um, about a year ago, uh, I was given an Amiga 1000 as a present by someone. He's like, hey, I've got an Amiga 1000. You want it? I know you used to be into Amiga. So I used, I used to have an Amiga 4000 back in the 90s and it was stolen. I was like heartbroken and stuff. And this guy, Amiga 1000, I'm like, yeah. So I got this thing and then I suddenly felt motivated. So, okay, now I have to do something with this Amiga because it's, what's the point in having one if I'm not gonna like do anything with it? So I was like, I'll port a BitTorrent client to it that I wrote uh, as a learning exercise when I needed to, I've, become a, an expert on BitTorrent for a court case. I work at an ISP and some content owners uh, wanted to get IP addresses of our customers and they, subpo they subpoenaed us and they, they had uh, some 50 customers who like tell us their identity and stuff like that. They went to court and then we were actually fighting it and in order to fight it uh, my boss said hey what do you know about BitTorrent? So I was like I know what it is but I don't really I can't go to court and say, I've used BitTorrent, I'm an expert, right? So I was like, the only way to become an expert is to read the protocol, write a BitTorrent client. So I wrote that and it, it, it worked on Windows and OS X actually. So this guy gave me an Amiga 1000, I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna port my BitTorrent client to the Amiga 1000. So anyways, that's, that's kind of the background to it. So I think, mo raise your hand if you do not know what BitTorrent is. Okay, there's two people. So basically what BitTorrent is, is a decentralized mechanism for computers on the internet to share data. And so here's an example of like what this might look like. So this is Dizzy Torrent, so this is an Amiga. And then here's uTorrent and Transmission. They're running on uh, Windows and Linux or whatever. And these clients, they'll, they'll talk to each other and they say, hey, I've got like this little piece of the file and this little piece of the file and this little piece. This person's like, hey, I've got this and this. Let's like trade, right? So these the computers on the internet, they're they're trading little pieces of the file with each other. So instead of like FTP or a website where you've got one centralized location, and everyone's downloading from a centralized location, with BitTorrent, um, everyone's kind of like downloading from each other. So all you really need is a, the identity of the file that you're looking for, and that that'll be contained in a, in a little tiny file called a .torrent file, and then you kind of you run that and your computer will connect to another machine called the tracker, which basically everyone who wants to download that file or might have that file, they connect to the tracker and they say, here I am, I've got this file, or here I am, I'm interested in this file. So everyone who's interested, and there can be multiple trackers and stuff like that, so anyone who's interested in the file, uh, they kind of just notify this thing, this tracker, and then the tracker will tell anyone else who's interested in the file, oh, here's a bunch of IP addresses of other people, I don't know what they have, maybe they have something. So then your BitTorrent client will then connect to the other machines and say, what do you got? And they'll respond as in the protocol, and they say what they have. So now all the machines kind of have a little map of who has what, and they start trading pieces. So as long as one of these computers has all the parts of the file, eventually everyone will download all the parts of the file. And they're just 
bouncing it or they're kind of sharing with each other. So as your computer is downloading, it's making it available. So now, so anything that this has downloaded so far, it's willing to, to upload to other computers if they connect to it. Uh, it might be hard because it's, it's on a private IP address. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. So no one else can actually directly connect to this computer from here. So you rarely will, you'll, sometimes you'll see it upload, but most of the time it's just downloading because it's hard for other peers to connect to it. So I'm, I'm gonna work on a workaround for that, but we'll, we'll move on. So everyone kind of understands the basic gist of it. BitTorrent was written in, uh, actually I can go on to the next thing. Oh, I didn't write that down here. Oh yeah, 2001. This guy actually invented BitTorrent. So it's a, rel it's a relatively more modern uh, protocol um, compared to, to the Amiga. It's the main way that people would exchange very large files on the internet. Um, so some of the advantages of BitTorrent, I'll go quickly. Uh, I mentioned some of them already. There's no centralized point of failure. There's no, there's no like single website or FTP site. As long as people out there have pieces of the file, they can, they can trade with each other. Um, another advantage, a single torrent file can refer to an entire archive. So it could have like 500 files in it or something. And as your BitTorrent client is downloading, you can see the 500 files. Actually, I can show that on here quickly. Uh, I guess I think this one has multiple files. I'll just switch that. It takes a few steps. Oh, there we go. So this one's actually downloading. These are the names of the files it's downloading. And with, so with BitTorrent, as a file completes, it's, it's there. So even though if it's like a zip file or .lha, you can't look at it until the whole thing's downloaded. But someone can actually just have an archive full of files, and they're not all packed in, a, in, a, in an archive. So as an individual file is complete, you can start using it or whatever, even though you're not done the whole thing. Uh, for some reason, I keep looking at you. I think it's because you said you didn't know what BitTorrent was. So it's like, I'll teach you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, you can stop a download any time, resume it later. Uh, any advantages? Oh, uh, data is, unlike FTP and stuff, when BitTorrent's downloading a file, each piece as it comes down, it knows a SHA1 hash, which is like a mathematical signature for, for the piece of the file. So the computer's actually confirming the information as it receives it. And that way it also avoids sending other computers on the internet corrupted data. So, so each computer is responsible for confirming as it as it receives it, and then that way it won't upload corrupted data to other to other BitTorrent clients. But they're all they're all doing this at the same time. So, you, so you know when you get the file, you've actually got the right thing. Um, well, let's move on. There's a question here. Are you sure. Saying that Part of the file could come from one source, and another part of that same file could yes. come from another source. Yes. Yes. Like, yeah. And the computer or the the BitTorrent combines them. Yes. Okay. So, so an old analogy would be like if you wanted to get a book, okay, but this is like getting a book by postcard. So, <laughs> you know, you get, you, get, you get these postcards in and you put them in order and you eventually have the book. But this postcard can come from Canada, this one can come from France, this book, and then, and then as you get postcards, you, you would then also send them out to other people who want them. And as long as and as long as around the world, one set of postcards exists, then everybody can get the file because eventually everybody will send each other this postcard with this you know paragraph of this book. And, and everybody having these files, these files have to be identical. Yes, and that's what the SHA one hashes are for. So every post, so using the postcard analogy, every postcard has a little mathematical checksum on it, and. You're, you know what the checksum is supposed to be because that's what was, there, there's a little kind of identity file associated with, with, with the real file. The real file could be like one gigabyte and what you will have is something called a dot torrent file which will be like 10 kilobytes or something like that. And that dot torrent file will have those mathematical signatures. But that's the only thing it has. So you can go onto like a website or something and download a dot torrent file and then with the .torrent file, your BitTorrent client can then go out onto into the internet and, and get all the, the, the postcards from from all the other computers. That that's a, I like that analogy. Um, do you want me to go on? Please. Cool. Okay. Uh, so some of the features of Dizzy Torrent. Its protocol uh, has full compatibility with other BitTorrent clients of of other uh, operating systems and stuff. It has to, otherwise it would. 
you'd only be able to trade with other people using this torrent, which is not many people. It's like me. Um, so th this actually, I just released this yesterday. So I've been working on it. It's like now this it's, it's first coming out. Um, oh, reasonable multitasking performance. Yeah. So actually, there's a lot of control in there and how much you want it to throttle itself. So you can in, with the with the Amiga, you can like set priorities for processes. So usually, if I'm running this, I'll change it to to priority negative one. So it's it's immediately preempted. As soon as you start like doing anything, the, the, the operating system immediately starts taking away clock cycles from BitTorrent. So your actual your OS seems to be perfectly fine. It's con it constantly monitors how much RAM is available in the computer. You can actually, but by default, it, it'll it will guarantee that it leaves like four meg of RAM or something like that. Like right now, you can see this thing's running. Let me click on the workbench, and um, there's 118 meg of RAM left. Uh, this has a this has like 130 meg in, in total, so it doesn't use that much memory. But if you had a machine with less memory than this, it, it kind of monitors because if it gets obviously if your computer starts running out of memory, uh, it's bad. And you can set that threshold to make it bigger, and it's just checking every now and then how much RAM do I have, how much RAM do I have. It will it will kind of like reduce its consumption if it needs to. Um, uh, it's stable and reliable, I hope. Uh, OS compliant. Yeah, I've tested this on uh, with a JIT like emulator on U uh, Unix Amiga emulator. It actually runs on a Windows machine uh, under emulation faster than uTorrent uh, running native. Um, so I, I I don't know if it's uTorrent has advertisements and stuff, so that could be that could be part of it. But this is like really optimized. It needed to be optimized to, to be able to perform. And unlike the developers of uTorrent, um, I had the advantage of, Nick, of a really old computer to try to make it run on, whereas they were running it on more modern machines, so it's, it's less obvious. But this thing will download faster than uTorrent on the exact same hardware running under Amiga emulation. Um, <laughs> sure. You, didn't you, the, the guys who did uTorrent, get in some kind of hot water over actually running uh, some kind of process on your computer without your knowledge? Um, I'm not sure can't, if it was. It might have. It could have been. For my ISP yeah, it could have been. I don't. I haven't heard. I heard of. Like I, I got rid of. I, I run Deluge on, on a Linux box. Yeah. Um, so. I don't know if it's uTorrent. I don't think it's uTorrent, because the BitTorrent company, like the the actual. Oh, it was a different one. It was a different. Yeah, it was a different I can't company. The name of it right, and so the only so this this doesn't do that. The only way you could ever really be sure that some software is not uh, doing something like that is to is to run a packet sniffer on your network and, and see what's actually coming out of, of the computer. Uh, but well, a, a Windows computer in and of itself is so noisy on a network, it, a packet sniffer would be a lot of work. Right, your Amiga though is not going to actually be sending oh, no. out anything other than what you what you launch, right? So, so you it's a lot. It will be if someone wanted to sneak some software onto onto your network. It would be harder for them to hide it by putting it on a computer that intrinsically has not that it's an older computer has much less RAM. It has it's much harder to have anything running in the background. But there there's no Trojans on this or something. So <laughs> oh no, I wasn't applying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is possible when you're running BitTorrent. You're running any internet software. Yes, there's there's if you you have to kind of trust uh, where you're getting it from. Um, you put a piece of software on, it's a black box on your computer, so if it's doing something and you don't know what it's doing, then uh, that's just the nature of the thing. You're, you're trusting someone. Someone's saying, hey, run this on your computer. Like, you, either you trust them or you're not sure, and then, or, you know, there, there could be an issue, but, it, but uh, that's just all software is like that. Um, I'll go on. Uh, okay, yeah, so here we, we're starting to get to the meat of uh, the presentation. So I ran into a, a number of technological problems that I had to solve to get BitTorrent to work on an Amiga. Um, just quickly going through the list. Fast filing system on an Amiga was specifically designed uh, really for the assumption that your hard drive would be 100 meg. You know, 150 meg is a big one. I when I got my 4000 in, in the 90s, I had a 120 meg hard drive, and I was like, "Yeah, this is huge." And the biggest hard drive I had back then, after having it for years, was like 700 700 meg hard drive. Fast filing system: the larger the file is, 
the worse your the worse your sequential I/O, your random I/O on that file becomes. Seeking it to the end of a large file and fast filing system requires many I/O operations to, to find the end of the file. The the fast filing system literally does not record where the file is in one spot. You're you're tracing through, so you you, you read about. 30 kilobytes or something like that, and then it's like, okay, where's the next piece? 30 more kilobytes, where's the next piece? 30 more kilobytes. So the problem with BitTorrent is the entire protocol is based on this idea that your scat, you have pieces of the file coming from all over the place, and someone says, hey, I've got this part of the file at the end, and someone says, hey, do you have this thing from the middle of the file? So fast filing system, um, even if you're using an SS, like a solid state memory, your computer is physically incapable of knowing where the data is on the computer. So that's one of the problems I had. I'll tell you the solution I came up with. Um, I have a question. How many pieces of data does a torrent break a file into? So, so the ones we're running here, uh, this Ubuntu um, distribution has, I think, like almost 3,000 pieces, and it's it's like 1.4 gigabytes, and this, this one here is about 900 megabytes, and I think it has like 2,000 pieces or something like that. So it's, it's thousands of would pieces. It, would it make sense to save individual pieces as individual files until the very end, and then have your computer just assemble individual files into one giant file once you have everything? Uh, I, I looked at, thought of that, and the problem is that when you have lots of files, it's the, the same issue structure. with the directory yeah. structure. It can't yeah. find that file right. quickly. Yeah. Um, so another uh, slight issue I came in, it was a learning experience for me. On, uh, on Linux, where I kind of learned how to do most of this stuff, um, you can have multiple threads accessing a single file simultaneously and writing to, to the file simultaneously. So for BitTorrent, that's convenient because you're gonna have multiple threads for multiple computers you're talking to and they're writing to the file. Amigo OS, it's different, it's, it's locking. So if, if one thread is writing to the file and another thread tries to write to the file, it'll get an error. So that just was a debugging thing because I was getting weird errors and I didn't understand. So um, the, a, a big constraint is that SHA-1 is extremely uh, CPU intensive. I'll show you my optimizations about that. Um, I don't want to talk about the next one, it's kind of boring. Resource tracking. A slight uh, issue and advantage in a way is the Amiga OS doesn't really keep track of which processes have allocated what. Uh, it does to some things, but for a lot of things it, it doesn't know who has allocated things. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a good faith uh, system where the OS kind of trusts the software. It's like, hey software, you wanted something, here it is, please give it back because I don't remember where I sent it. Um, that can be an advantage and I use that a little bit because since the OS doesn't keep track of where it's given resources to. It also means you can allocate those resources in lots of little tiny segments, and it, and it has very little overhead. Because unlike another operating system, it's actually keeping track of everything. With Amiga OS, since it's not keeping track of everything, it, you can save a lot of memory that way. So I actually took advantage of that, I'll, I'll show you. Um, I won't, maybe I won't talk about the C++ issues. Uh, lack of multicast support. I'm trying. I'm slowly investigating how to work around that. Basically, there's certain parts of the BitTorrent protocol which are, are more difficult to implement on, on Amigo OS because there's a there's a feature of TCP/IP called multicast, and most of the network devices for the Amiga don't support it. But I don't think we need to talk. About, um, maybe I can talk if anyone's interested. I can do it one on one and have a little chat. It's, it's kind of boring for most people. Um, obviously, the Amiga is older and slow, uh, and obviously, yeah, it's harder to find other programmers who can give you advice and stuff, because most of them have moved on to, to other operating systems by now, so uh, that's just, that's part of the course. Okay, so fast filing system, we were talking about it. So in my experiments, seeking into a one gig file could take a minute. So someone says, hey, can you, do you, have the, you, you claim to have this piece of the file close to the end of the file, and then your computer will basically freeze for a full minute wh while it's attempting to get that file. Uh, the filing system runs at priority 10, so uh, that really means all normal processes are literally like locked out. So, when, so it lo looks like your computer has suddenly frozen. So th this was the behavior that, that I was kind of getting, which, which, I found, which I made some workarounds for. Um, so, I'll just show you 
I don't think we need to get too much into it, but basically the, a file is kind of broken up into se segments like this, and in each page of the file, I don't want to spend too much time talking on this, there's basically a list, and that list can only fit um, like 50 pointers or something, and it's just pointing to other pieces of the file, but after you've, after you've exhausted that list, then it has to have this extension thing which points to another list. And so it's a list pointing to another list, pointing to another list. This is called a linked list, if anyone's a programming error. And that's fast filing system. It uses linked lists to, to store the locations of, of uh, pieces of your file. So this, let me just see if I have another slide. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave that up there. So the solution I came up with for this is taking advantage of the fact that there's no uh, resource tracking in AmigaOS. File handles in AmigaOS use almost no memory at all. So you can have unlimited <coughs> file handles, unlike basically every other operating system. AmigaOS, a file handle is a, is a, little, is like a little piece of data that, that you've told the operating system, hey, I would like to read this, I would like to open this file and uh, give, me a, give me a little piece of memory to associate with a file on the disk. Other operating systems, since they keep track of who they're opening handles for, uh, they have constraints on how many you're allowed to have. Or there might be performance issues where the more you've allocated, certain operations get slower and slower. AmigaOS doesn't keep track of them, so you can actually open up as many as you want. So what, what, what I do for a large file, let's say one gigabyte or whatever, I have 300 file handles. And each file handle, I remember, I remember where the file handles are actually pointing. So if someone seeks a piece of data like halfway through the file, or I'm writing some data halfway through the file, I now have a handle that's pointing right there. So the next time I need some data, I look for the file handle that's, that's just earliest prior to where I'm seeking, because you can seek forward. N none of this, oh, that, that thing I showed you, none of it has a pointer pointing backwards. It only has pointers pointing forwards. So you can seek forward a short distance and it'll seek really fast. So by the time I have 300 file handles open, as this pro process is running, so right at the beginning it's kind of slow, and towards the end the file access actually speeds up and it gets to the point where you've got, where it has file handles all over the file, and now the BitTorrent client is kind of running just as fast as if, as if it could do direct random access. Um, if I use smart filing system, there's no, there's no problem here, but I wanted to talk about fast filing system because that, uh, that's something that, lo that lots of people are still using. Um, another thing I've done is in order to solve the issue with multiple threads having concurrent access, I have a single thread now that's its sole responsibility is to do uh, uh, file operations and the other threads just kind of send it a message. So, so MegaOS has a very fast interprocess uh, communication system where you can, instead of having to copy large pieces of data around, you just send a pointer to the data. So a thread can say, hey, I need some file, I need some data from the disk at this position. And here, put it like, this is where I want you to store it. And it just sends a message to this other thread and it gets queued. So now there's this thread that's just going around doing file access continuously. It's responding to read requests, to write requests, and those requests are getting to take advantage of that algorithm where it's like looking for a file handle that's near the piece. So we've solved the problem with multiple threads having concurrent access. We've solved the problem with uh, the, the, the fast filing system not being able to do random access very quickly. Um, one other issue, that, that the fact that it seeks at priority 10 and kind of locks up the computer. So what I've done is, th there's no way to, to, there's no easy way without really risking the operating system to say change the priority of your filing system. So you, you need to kind of leave that alone. You, you, you can change it, but it's probably not safe. Uh, it's certainly not OS compliant to change the priority of filing system. So what I've really done is I, I know how, the, the software knows how far it needs to seek to find the piece, and it kind of measures how fast the filing system is reacting, and it, may, and it chops up the, uh, the seek. So instead of seeking, say, 100 meg, it will chop that up and it'll seek so it can, it can have a context switch, like 10 times a second. So, you're, so it seeks a little bit and then it drops the priority zero, basically. And then it seeks a little bit and drops the priority zero. Every time it drops the priority zero, that's an opportunity for the rest of your operating system to work normally. So now with fast filing system, uh, 
it runs fine in the background. Like as a user, you wouldn't notice that it, that it's actually doing all this stuff. Um, and at the end result, the performance gets almost to be as fast as a uh, smart filing system. So that's uh, all right. Uh, SHA1. Okay, so this is an algorithm that BitTorrent has to use to, to do the confirmation of every little piece of data that comes in. It's very CPU intensive, and um, it, it basically would take something, like on a 50 megahertz machine, it would take something like 70% uh, of the available CPU just to do SHA1. And that's only if you're downloading at like uh, 40 kilobytes a second. So th this computer right now, I've, op I've optimized it in a lot, so the SHA1 uses less than half of the, uh, of, the, of the CPU time. There's a single SHA thread whose sole purpose is to do SHA uh, hashes, and it's, this, it's one thread for all torrents simultaneously. So if you're running three copies of this, they'll actually send their, their requests for SHA verification to a single thread so that way there's no context switching. Context switching is when you have two processes running at the same time that both want the CPU. So the CPU has to like copy all its registers to RAM, load the, the, the other copy of the registers back into the CPU from the other process, switch to the other process, run a little bit, save all this registers back to RAM, load the registers back to the CPU, switch back again. So if you've got two processes who both want the CPU and you're context switching like that, it's very inefficient. So instead of doing it, I have one process that uh, does the SHA, and I've optimized the code a lot. So, there, so SHA out the algorithm for SHA has kind of been it's like published, so you can find the algorithm. The standard algorithm. This is just a little piece of it. So the standard algorithm is kind of uh, easy, e easy in a way to to read. And it's easy to tell if you made a mistake. And it does certain operations over and over and over again, the exact same line of code. This isn't a loop. So if there's a mistake in that line of code, then it'll be a massive mistake. So you'll, e you'll easily notif notice it. This is not very efficient for the computer to actually execute this. Each time, this is a for loop. Um, I guess people only, I tried to make this like pseudocode a little bit, but it still looks like C language. So basically, this for loop, every time it gets down here, it has to make a decision. Should I go back up here or should I keep going? So each time it comes down here, the computer's asking itself a question. That's not efficient. Like, I know this is going to loop 20 times. So why would I make the computer keep asking itself the same question 20 times when, when it's going to be the answer is yes, loop 19 times. So that's inefficient. This logical, this part right here, the computer's asking itself to do some math. And it's doing one, two, three, four logical operations. Laying it out that way is pretty easy for a human being to understand or a computer programmer. But if you change it, instead of using AND and OR and NOT, if you change it to use XOR, which is an exclusive OR operation and ANDs, you can actually reduce it to three operations. So that by itself, you've knocked off 25% of the, of the computational time. So you, and, and what's happening here, you notice how this is only appearing one time, and down here it's appearing five times. I've, this, this version of the algorithm actually performs less of these loops. It, this one loops 20 times, this one only loops four times. So that, is, that knocks off some, uh, some time. Another thing, you're, if you look around here, these assignments, every time it does this loop, where it says E equals D, D equals C, C equals something, B equals A, A equals a value, it comes back around. It's actually taking data and it's shifting it. It's, it, has, it has five variables, A, B, C, D, E, and it's kind of like shifting the, the data through it. It's doing this mathematical thing. It's kind of like chopping it up into little pieces, and if at the end of it, it arrives at a number that matches the SHA signature, then you've confirmed that the, the data is correct. So this is doing the same thing, but instead of doing as much shifting around, it's kind of forward-looking, and it tries to see, okay, after I, after I rotate three times, A will end up having the value that I could have computed right off the top simply by doing this operation. Uh, anyway, so this is kind of dry, but long story short, at the end of the optimi optimization, it's down here in red, so I've heard I have 93% fewer branches, 75% fewer logic operations, 64% fewer math operations, and 70% fewer uh, assignments. 
and the whole thing runs like twice as fast as the as the original uh, SHA. So that's that. Um, resource tracking, we talked about that a bit. Actually, we talked about everything on this list. And I will, yeah, I can just leave that here. Anything on here I need to mention? Oh, if someone's good at making icon artwork, I really would like to have an icon for this, and I suck at that, so. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking at how I can uh, kind of work around the problem with, with multicast support. So some SANA2, SANA2 is, the, is the standard that Amiga uses for network devices, and some of them, the, the SANA2 is, a very low, is kind of a very low level uh, piece of software, um, it's almost at the, at the hardware level, like it's below your, it's below AMI TCP, it's like, it's below your TCP stack. It's, uh, you'll have one for every type of device. So I have a clip box on here, which is a parallel port uh, Ethernet uh, adapter, and there's a specific SANA2 device for clip box, and that same piece of software will be used whether you're using Roadshow or AMI TCP or w whatever stack you're using, that same driver uh, it's called like plitbox.device, will, w is used for all the stacks. Now the plitbox doesn't have multicast support. So unless I kind of modify the, the driver for plitbox, um, I'm not gonna really get multicast support on that. But if my Amiga 1200, I have a PCM CIA Wi-Fi card, and the driver for that does have uh, multicast support. AMI TCP does not have multicast support. So what I'm thinking of doing is making DizzyTorrent bypass the stack completely. So it's using AMI TCP for, for normal things, and then it'll go directly to the SANA2 driver to, to do some multicast stuff. If I get that to work, uh, I kind of, I started working it a month ago and I didn't want to mess around too much because I was planning on releasing this like today. So I didn't actually try to put it in there. But if I can get that to work, then, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of these terms, but there's, there's something called local peer, local peer discovery, um, distributed hash tables, uh, there's ma mag links, um, there's uh, UPnP. U UPnP is a protocol to allow your, your, your computer to open up a port to, to listen to incoming connections, and it will talk to your router and automatically have the router open up a public port uh, that faces the internet UPnP requires multicast. A lot, a, lot, a lot of these more modern kind of little uh, features require multicast. Multi it's basically a protocol where someone can, where you can kind of prearrange and say, okay, here's a bunch of computers you haven't heard of each other before, but if you kind of speak these magic words on the internet, then you'll all kind of find each other. So that's like multicast. And back in the day, it was even though it was invented in the 80s, there was no software that needed it for anything. So it was just like not implemented in, in the Amiga TCP stacks. And what I'm kind of hoping is if I start kind of going down that road, then some people will take some of the SANA2 drivers and actually uh, implement multicast in their drivers. It might like, get some people excited about something. So uh, hopefully that'll happen. Uh, and then I want to try to see if I can make a native uh, PowerPC version, because uh, this is just 68K. I have to start somewhere though. Has, has anybody tested this on the Vampire? Uh, I no. That's, no one's no one else has tested on anything except for me because I only uploaded it to Aminet yesterday and <laughs> there's a I drop have a box. Vampire and I have an SD net. Maybe when I get home I'll try it. Here. For sure, and I can I can give you a Dropbox link. I posted a link on on Facebook. I don't know when it'll show up on Aminet, but you can actually download it now because there's a there's a Dropbox link. So you, okay. I'll, but I think it would work because it because it works on. JIT and if, if JIT uh, like on Unix Amiga emulator, if you have the, the yeah, JIT yeah. compile, uh, like what's it called? Uh, just in time, just in time yeah. compiling or whatever. So that like you can emulate an Amiga on a on a on a, on a PC or something now. And uh, there's a there's a thing called JIT that tries to make it go really fast. And what it does is it actually takes the Motorola bit code and kind of like tries to translate it into Intel. Um, so if you're doing some stuff that's like really not nice, then it'll like crash. But it actually works perfectly on JIT. So that like I tried to make this really OS compliant, right? And it actually works flawlessly on JIT and extremely quickly on JIT. So 
I have, I believe it should probably work on Vampire, and it doesn't use FPU. Um, okay. I, I have, I have an FPU on this machine, and I tried, I, I do a little bit of floating point, but it's like so little that it didn't give any performance increase whatsoever. So it just does software, like I, you know what you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's, it's exactly not real FPU. Talking. It's like software emulation of FPU yeah. or whatever. So um, I think I'm interested to, to know if it'll work on the vampire and how fast okay. it runs. Well, we'll exchange contact for sure. And let you know. All right. So there's that the final page. So any uh, any questions? Yeah. It's a 16 megabyte RAM, but uh, I thought the most you could get on that machine is 8 megs. So I actually have 132 meg. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the 8 meg limit is uh, the 24 bit CPU in the Amiga 1200. If you have uh, even a real O tool, you can do what, up to 4 gigabytes. With the real O tool? Theoretical high. I think it's basically like 2 gigabytes because. Theoretical maximum. But lots of there's a pro, lots of people use the normal signed integers and then they put they do in theory it could be four gig but yeah. Amiga OS I think has already partitioned it and lots of software will probably fail if you ever went higher than two because they'll right. use a signed integer rather than an unsigned integer. Oh, I, I got you. All right. So yeah, an Amiga Amiga OS can support up to two gig of RAM and the Motorola uh, if you have anything higher like an O two O or higher can actually support two gig of RAM. So it was pretty far fetched for the, the ECO tool in the 1200 has a 24 bit address space, and that's where that limitation, I believe, is coming in. Yeah, and I, it, on that? I'm, um, I heard I heard that there's a there's a there's a limitation of fast RAM on an on an on an unaccelerated uh, 1200, but I'm not sure if it's I'm not sure if if that's just because the the. <laughs> I don't. I don't the, really the, know the what the bus, reason is. I, I, I think the bus is thirty. Yeah, maybe. maybe. But, the bus. The, but the CPU. Yeah. It's a. It's a crippled CPU. Basically, it's. There's a, something. A cost reduced version. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I. I. I haven't tried running this. Uh, my, like without my accelerator for my A1200. Um, actually, I haven't. If I don't use RAM, if I don't use extra RAM, I only have two meg of RAM. So I know I need like sixteen meg of RAM. So it can't work. It won't work on an unaccelerated. A twelve hundred because I got an accelerated and uh, sixty four megs of RAM in mine. I'll it should run. It I've it. I've tested this down to I've tested it on sixteen megabytes of RAM on uh, Unix and Media Emulator. Like I'm just reducing reducing the memory. Yeah. Um, it's it's not going to be able, it won't be able to have lots of simultaneous connections if your, if your RAM is that little. Yeah. But it'll have a few. It'll it'll run. Yeah. Um, That's very cool. Uh, Have you ever bothered to uh, keep track how many times the shell one hash is failing? Yeah, it keeps track. It, and how? Never. Never. No, and I've also I've also connected this to uh, my my Windows computer and had and ran uTorrent on my Windows computer and blocked it from accessing the rest of the internet, so it has to download all the the file from the Amiga. I mean, and then it passes on on uTorrent as well. I mean, so. uh, like in terms of the, the hash function. Oh, people on the internet? Yeah, the, the, the fact that the hash takes a really long time to compute, it's, it's CPU intensive. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, like, how often does it turn out that the hash goes, oh crap, there's there's an error in this data, we got to refetch yeah. it. Yeah, so you probably can't read that line. Yeah. But it says, I, I have this idea for a, for a catch up optimistic. SHA-1 verification because right. hash fails almost never happen. Right. So I was thinking they can well, just be yeah. deferred until later. Yeah, you're right. I didn't yeah. see that. That's like exactly what I was you, thinking. You it's can't like, really read it. Yeah, and, I, and it's I've tested it. list here. You're on yeah. an Amiga. You <laughs> just not do the SHA-1 hash. Well, the, the thing is, it's like it almost never fails. I've never yeah. seen it fail. Right. So since I've never seen it fail, that means it basically almost never fails. Right. So I can just pretend that it passed without checking. And uh, okay. and then so uh, so it actually it, it makes it run like uh, so on on this computer um, uh, when the wind's at my back I'm going to get like 40 to 8, 50 kilobytes a second when I turn off the the SHA one it goes over 80 kilobytes a second um, so it's a, it's a big big improvement um, on on uh, Unix Amiga emulator on my on my I have at home I have like a uh, 20 or 20, it's nominally a 20 megabit, um, that's how fast my internet connection is. 
it's really only about 18 megabits. Like I never get more than 18 megabits. So on my Windows machine, I get 18 megabits a second with with this, and it uses uh, there's a, there's a program there's an Amiga program called Scout, uh, which kind of tells you how much CPU you're using, and it uses about 15 percent of of the Amigas, like in Amiga OS, it says my CPU is 15% busy and I'm getting 18 megabits a second and this is under emulation. And, and the Amiga can only use one core. So my, my real Windows computer has a lot of like multiple cores, but Amiga OS is, is using one core, right? So once you put it on more modern hardware, it's extremely like efficient and, and fast and stuff. So yeah, I, I'm quite curious to see if maybe on a vampire it might get the speed of your network hardware. It, it might not even be well, CPU. Be that would be interesting. I don't even know what, what speed I can push across an SD net adapter. So, so yeah, that's I, can I'm stream, curious. I can stream audio on it with, without any issues. There seems to be plenty of bandwidth left over. So. Mm. And, and, I, and I've been doing lots of testing with, like, I, this is almost like a, uh, like a benchmark program in a way. Because I, I, I have the Ethernet PCMCIA adapter, and I've got, like, Basically, I have two Amigas and an emulator and stuff. So I run this, I download the same torrent like a few times and I see how long it takes to like grab it off the internet. And it actually kind of gives me an idea of when th things have kind of changed. And if I change the code a little bit, then I'll run it again and, and see if like if it changes the, uh, the speed as it's downloading. Uh, anything else? Is, oh. In your one slide, you talked about the C++ doesn't have the logic thread, so how did you have it implemented without? Uh, okay, so yeah, so there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a threading library called uh, N, N, uh, NP thread, which, so po POSIX threads is, is kind of like a more Unix um, standard for doing, for doing multi-threaded multi programming. Uh, technically speaking, Amiga OS doesn't support multi-threaded programming. It supports uh, real-time multitasking, but that's not really the same thing. So a multi-threaded program is when you have one program with multiple internal kind of threads that they almost run like different programs, but they're, real one, they're really one program and they share data structures and stuff like that. Since Amiga OS never had memory protection in the beginning and POSIX didn't even, like it wasn't even a, a thing yet, and there was no standards for multi-threaded programming. I, Sun had their own thing. It was like everyone had a little proprietary thing. But Amiga OS, it was like, what do you need multi-threading for? Just start another task. They can just share memory. Like all the benefits of multi-threaded programming, you don't. You can just do this with multi, with multitasking. And the 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 problem with that is is C came up with the thing called the standard template library and uh, some other really cool built into the language features that all of a sudden uh, you can't really do it very easily with multitasking. You can't have two separate tasks sharing a, uh, transparently sharing in, in a language transparent way, something like a list or a map or a heap or something like that. Because they all make assumptions about when they allocate memory, where that memory is coming from. So you've got two separate tasks and one says, hey, I want to I push something into a list and it needs to allocate some memory to push it on the list. It allocates the memory locally. And another one says, hey, I want to take something off the list. In a multi-threading way, that would work because they're sharing the memory. In a multitasking way, when this guy takes something off the list, what it's really doing and now it wants to deallocate the memory it never allocated the memory in the first place. It was this guy that allocated the memory because he pushed it on the list. This one's taking it off the list, deallocates the memory, and then boom, you got guru meditation error. So back in the early days, C++ never had this feature. Like n none of these built-in kind of algorithms existed back then. It was kind of C language. Multitasking is great. So that's kind of the, the, the issues I, I ran into. I do use a bit of multitasking, and I mix it with, with this non-preemptive multi-threading. Now, the problem with this non this it's called NP-thread, and the problem I discovered with NP-thread is it actually doesn't work properly in C++ either. C++ has a language feature called an exception, where, so if your code, you can, you can make it so that if your code has a little problem, instead of constantly checking, 
a result, like, hey, I'm calling a function. Does it come, is it a negative one or is it a zero or something like that? Is it a zero? And instead of constantly checking, did it work, did it work, did it work, did it work, did it work? You can just write your code in a, in a clean way where you just assume everything works. And then if someone, if some function has a problem somewhere, it does something called throwing an exception. And it throws an exception and then it'll kind of drop down in your code to an, another part where you can like handle the exceptions. If you wrote that exception handler, if you didn't write an exception handler, it kind of pops up to the next layer. And then that thing has an option to try to, to, to catch it if it wants to. And if it didn't want to catch it, it just boop, pops it up to the next layer. So this is kind of a recursive thing. So a problem that happens all the way at the bottom only gets caught at the level where someone is prepared to fix it. If none of your code is prepared to deal with this error, it goes all the way back up to the top. Your program can terminate, can spit out an error message or something like that. And meanwhile, your code that you wrote is easy to read because it's not full of this like, did it get a negative one? Did it get a negative one? Did it get a negative one? That doesn't work with NP threads. And I learned it the hard way because it works 99% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> So the program's working, da da la 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 segmentation fault. And I'm like, what happened? Your program's working, and all of a sudden, abort, uncaught, exception, whatever. And then and it, it took a while for me to convince myself that I didn't have like it bugs. Um, I talked to the guy who ported. He ported the pos MP thread is, I, I don't remember who wrote it, but it's like a GNU thing. And he ported it to the Amiga. And it, tur it turns out he ported it in one day. And then I was talking with him. He's like, why do you need exceptions for? And tell me one good reason why you would ever need to use exceptions. He's a C, he's a C programmer, and in C where you don't have exceptions in C, perfect, it works amazing. And he was trying to convince me to stop using exceptions. And I was like, uh, okay, so basically I, I had to stop using exceptions. I still have them every now and then, but it's only in certain parts of the code where I know I'm safe uh, from this thing. And I have ideas to stop using NPthread, uh, so that way I can do it myself. Had I known at the beginning that it wasn't compatible, I would have wrote it a different way. But I kind of went down this route where the thing works 99% of the time. So when there was a problem, I thought it was me at first, right? So that's... It's me, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's where it is. So this MP thread library, if you, if you Google it or whatever, if you want to use it, works great for C language. And in C++, it'll still work, but you cannot use exceptions. Just don't use exceptions at all, because uh, you will randomly not be able to detect them. Um, anything else? Cool. If anyone, if anyone wants to to hook up with me or whatever, I can kind of tell you where you can download this. It should appear on Aminet uh, anytime now. Uh, but I've already posted it on Facebook. I made a Dropbox link so people can download it. Uh, in terms of in terms of the the, the licensing model, it's, it's it's public domain, but I'm keeping the source code. However, since I'm using NP Thread and NP Thread is released under the LGPL license, which is the Lesser GNU Public License, it obligates me to give you the object files so you can actually go in fix. Uh, NP thread <laughs> and relink the the binary so you have all the object files and you have the complete ability to actually like link them together so you can replace parts of them you could replace the SHA one I'm actually going to publish an API because I'm hoping that someone could maybe make an 060 optimized uh, version of the SHA one because it's that's all kind of in, embedded in one spot so there's parts of the program I don't want to release yet uh, there's parts of the program that I am planning on making like open source, but I haven't like figured out the, that yet right now. But you can you can actually like build like not you can't compile it, but you can build it, and uh, so that, that's the, the status of, of that. My what I'm kind of thinking is making the version that has once I figure out multicast support, I'm thinking of making. The one with these features, which is just stand. This is standard. This is true full implementation of BitTorrent version kind of 1.0, and it has a few extra extensions that came later in BitTorrent. The multicast stuff; those are all optional protocols. I'm kind of thinking if I manage to figure out how to get multicast to work, to make UPnP and stuff like that kind of feature, like the premium version will be like nine dollars or nine ninety nine or something like that. But the standard version, I don't intend to to charge for it. The alternative is to make you watch advertising. <laughs> <laughs>
Because <laughs> that's what uTorrent does, right? Anything else? Nope. And thank you very much. Yeah, and I hope you. Yeah, if anyone wants to come, I have some. You were, someone was wondering how I managed to get so much memory and stuff. They can see the uh, hardware jammed into the side expansion port on the A1000. Uh, does this kind of work? Do you ever have trouble to make this game work if I do a mapping? Uh, I have to I click on. No. It's not that good of a game. Please.